Hello, and welcome to the Wallace Collection. My name is Yuriko Jackal. I am the head of the curatorial department and the curator of French paintings. Today, I'm standing in the midst of the small drawing room, which has recently been relit and refurbished thanks to the generosity of a special benefactor. The relighting project has given this room a new sense of energy. The crystals of the chandelier are sparkling. The gilt bronze is gleaming. And the colorful canvases by Antoine Watteau and his followers, Jean-Baptiste Pater and Nicolas Lancre, have regained their freshness. Watteau is credited with the creation of a genre that we know today as the Fête Galante. Paintings made in the style are dreamlike depictions of beautifully dressed aristocratic types relaxing in lush parkland settings. But today, I'm going to be looking at a work by Watteau that is a little bit different. It's known as Voulez-vous triompher des belles? At 35 by 25 centimeters, it's barely larger than a sheet of A4 paper. It's tucked away in a corner of the small drawing room. One has to really look for it to find it, but I want to show you why it's so special. Like many of Watteau's compositions, the scene unfolds in a little grove or a park. And again, as is typical of Watteau's Fête Galante, the figures are beautifully dressed in the shimmering silks that only Watteau knew how to evoke. Look at the way the light skims across the ripples and folds of the fabric. The eye is immediately drawn to the texture of the material, which we imagine to be satiny, soft to the touch. In fact, Watteau chose in this instance to work on wooden panel, a support that gives the oil paint an especially lustrous appearance. At the same time, there's something curious about the landscape. The trees run wild, suggesting that this may not be a properly cultivated park. Peering into the distance, through the space between the trees, we see still more trees, a whole forest of them, in fact. The people are seated directly on the ground, and this isn't carefully tended lawn. We see patchy mounds of earth showing through tufts of grass. There's also something curious about the individuals, beyond the fact that they're incongruously gathered in this strange thicket of trees. While their silk and lace clothing is elegant, they're not dressed like typical members of early 18th century French society, whose attire was documented by Watteau, both in his paintings and in his series of fashion plate etchings. Rather, they wear theatrical costumes. Starting with the little cluster of individuals in the background, we can identify them one by one. The seated man appears to wear the rough and floppy hat of the lovelorn trickster Mezetin. To his left is Il Dottore, in his fitted cap, flat ruff, and black gown, a play on the academic dress of the esteemed scholars of Bologna. The standing figure behind Mezzetin may be Tartaglia. He wears the enormous felt hat, large white ruff, and side-slung cloak of this character, commonly described as a short-sighted dreamer. In the foreground, Harlequin, with his colorful lozenge suit and black mask is unmistakable. And his presence enables us to recognize the lady beside him as his beautiful lover, Columbine. Because these are figures from the theater, we might imagine them to be performing some sort of play. But why would they do this in the middle of a forest? And if this truly was a stage play, wouldn't the point of the drama be more explicit? Here, the gestures are ambiguous. For instance, what are we to make of Harlequin's gesture towards Columbine, or the way in which he leans toward her, encroaching on her space? Certainly, he seems to have disturbed her. She pulls away from him, hand on heart, in a gesture of apprehension, even fright. Meanwhile, Tartaglia stands close to his group. He's part of the little circle of friends, but he appears to draw physically into himself. And with his downcast eyes and pressed lips, he appears sad and remote. We have an engraving made after the painting, and it is this engraving which has given us its title. Underneath the image itself is a poem that begins with the words, 
Voulez-vous triompher des belles? Do you want to conquer beautiful women? Tell them pleasantries. Talk to them in an entertaining tone. And be careful to keep a serious expression in their company. Love demands to be entertained. He's a child, tricked by everything. To please him, one should flirt. And he often refuses a wise man everything that a harlequin might obtain. Should we understand on this basis that the painting is about the darker side of seduction? About making someone believe that one is something one is not? This would be a very dark interpretation, and it's not clear that it's accurate. The engraving dates to 1725, four years after Watteau's death. And while Harlequin does appear to have startled Columbine, he seems off-balanced, almost tipsy, buffoonish, certainly, but not exactly menacing. While we may not be able to read the scene further than this, one thing is clear. Voulez-vous triompher des belles is emblematic of Watteau's deep interest in the theatrical form known as the Commedia dell'arte. There are a few defining features to the Commedia dell'arte, which developed in northern Italy in the 15th century. First, it was populated by a series of stock characters, each of whom possessed a few defining personality traits, all regularly evoked in Watteau's art. Piero was the sad clown. Mezzotin was by turn the lovesick fool and the scheming troublemaker. Harlequin was the light-hearted servant, and so forth. Second, these colorful characters were brought to life by professional actors. Even the female roles of the Commedia dell'arte were played by women, who were thus the first known professional female actors in Europe. And third, the performances were based upon set scenarios, but the dialogue itself was largely improvised by the actors, who tailored their remarks to their audience, thereby allowing for sly political commentary. From northern Italy, the Commedia dell'arte rapidly spread throughout Europe. The earliest recorded companies in France performed for no less than royalty, for the Italian-born queens Catherine de' Medici and Marie de' Medici. In 1680, the Commedia dell'arte was given an official home in Paris at the theater of the Hôtel de Bourgogne, so-called because it was built on the grounds of the former residence of the Dukes of Burgundy. This was an appealing space, as shown by Abraham Boss's 1643 engraving, showing a contemporary play unfolding on its stage. The Commedia dell'arte troupe in France had thus achieved what every itinerant company dreams of, a fixed theater, a spiritual home. In 1697, this all changed. King Louis XIV, previously an enthusiastic supporter, interpreted their play, The False Prude, as a veiled attack on his deeply religious mistress, Madame de Maintenon. The furious king ordered that the troupe be expelled from their theater at the Hôtel de Bourgogne and vanished from Paris. Some left the country. Those who stayed back had to keep at least 30 leagues, about 90 miles or 145 kilometers, outside of the French capital. The situation remained at an impasse for nearly two decades. The official company was not reinstated in Paris until 1716 shortly after the king's death. When Watteau moved to the French capital five years later, in 1702, he had the opportunity to witness firsthand the aftermath of the king's decision, an event that has been described as one of the most significant in the history of popular theater in France. The memory of this trauma had remained vivid. Watteau recreated it in a lost composition that is known from an engraving of 1729. The youth on a ladder posts the royal decree closing down the theater, and a magistrate ushers the company out. The players, all dressed in full costume, wring their hands, gesture heavenward, and otherwise express their shock and sorrow. At the same time, the themes and character of the Commedia dell'arte had become, if anything, even more ubiquitous, as Watteau discovered when he arrived in Paris. The French capital was then a metropolis that was growing in every direction, with a population of some 500,000 inhabitants, second in size only to the enormity of London. Watteau found work on the Pont Notre Dame, not so far from the former home of the Commedia dell'arte at the Hôtel de Bourgogne, 
this major thoroughfare connected the city across the Seine. A hive of artistic and economic activity, it was the perfect vantage point to observe city life. The expelled Italian players had sought refuge in the famous fairground theaters situated outside of city limits, as shown by Jean-Baptiste Pater in a painting commemorating the annual Fair of Beson, just outside Paris. And inside the city, new performers had taken to the streets, where they staged impromptu comedy sketches and made the popular stock figures of Harlequin and his friends a regular feature on the urban landscape. Voulez-vous triompher des Belles was likely made while the decree of exile was still in effect. It may be that the wild nature of the forest that Watteau has depicted was a reference to the fact that the Commedia dell'Arte was officially homeless. The new stage that he has imagined for these displaced players reflects their ambiguous place between the grittiness of the Paris streets and the prune landscape of the courtly Fête Galante. In the process, Vateau has refocused attention on their humanity. The viewer is encouraged to wonder about their brooding, their melancholy, even their moments of embarrassment. Away from the expectations of the formal stage set, it's their emotions rather than their comic personas that take precedence. Thank you for watching this video. I hope we'll see you at the Wallace Collection soon.